Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've joined us. As you probably know, we are looking at the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh Adventist Church for the first quarter of 2013. This is lesson number seven in that series entitled Through a Glass Darkly. It's the lesson which we will all be studying on February 16 of 2013. So we would encourage you to grab your Bible, be prepared to look up the text if necessary, and begin with us by bowing your head in a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we have looked at nature, we've looked at scripture, we have considered both and all that might be implied through them about you. Help us to understand the issues that we need to talk about in this lesson and understand the various aspects of special and general revelation is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In this lesson, we will focus on two different types of revelation. General revelation is a study of what we can learn about God through nature. Special revelation is a study of what we learn about God from his divine intervention in or to humanity through prophets, apostles, and especially, of course, through the life of, and death of his son, Jesus. Up until the middle of the 19th century, scientists basically believed that they were studying God's handiwork in nature. If they were studying science, they thought this is studying God's handiwork. They believed that the orderliness of God's cre creation allowed for the study of science. If God had not created an orderly universe, we wouldn't, there wouldn't be any science, right? But in the middle of the 19th century, partly as a result of the oppressive activities of the predominant Christian church of those days, philosophers and scientists were seeking some way to explain origins apart from God. Today, many, probably a majority of scientists, believe, actually believe, that science and the Bible are in conflict with each other. One of the things we'll try to look at here in this lesson is, is that a true statement? Are science and the Bible in conflict? True science, that is. Well, how much does God intend for us to learn through nature and science? Can we learn important things about God through nature and science? Absolutely. <laughs> well, there was a time when there wasn't any scriptures. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of humanity had no... Abraham had any, no, had, didn't have any scripture. Job didn't have any scripture. Enoch didn't have any scripture. Noah didn't have any scripture as we know it. But they talked with God. Okay. They talked with God? Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Adam talked with God. Abraham talked with God. God talked, talked to Noah, for yeah. sure. God talked yeah. with Enoch. God talked to Noah, gave him directions for about the upcoming flood and how to, create, how to make the ark. Job had God? conversations with God. Not till afterwards. Well, no, that's a... Look, if you read Job 29 to 31... The reason he had the relationship he did with God because he talked with God many times. No, it says on the end that now yeah. I've seen him. Now I've, now I've seen, seen him. Seen him. Now I've seen him. But before. Okay, so it's a voice that comes out of the air? Well, I'm just telling you, if you read, <laughs> Job, if you read Job 29 to 31, he Job. says, you know, I just wish we could have back, we could have the kind of conversations we used to have, et cetera, et cetera. Read the middle. Those are, those are Job's last words, you know. We sometimes read through the book of Job and we, we read this stuff over here that Elihu says. That, those aren't Job's words. Those are Elihu's words. Go back and read Job's last words. It says at the end of chapter 31, and these are the final words of Job. Read those last couple of chapters. That's uh, the key part of this, of this book. It talks about how Job got that kind of a relationship with God to start out with. Now, if I said, I have conversations with God, would you know what I was talking about? Not for sure. We know you're a cuckoo. No, you would. You would. No, what? If, if I told you I have conversations with God, you'd know <coughs> what I meant by that, wouldn't you? I, I presume. I mean, you know, Is, I... Isn't there something where we can uh, call call the authorities and put you under watch for yeah. 72 hours? We'll keep our you know, in that you know, I, 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 I found out, I found out you back in Ellen White's God, time, but back in Ellen White's time, that it was very common to say I was shown by God. 
And um, what does that, you know what that means when somebody says that. Well, I know what it meant when, some, when Ellen White said that. I'm, I don't know. I don't have the examples of any other people, so I, I can't judge them. But they, that was a common expression back then. Could be. So, um, yeah. You so know, I, it, dep it depends how literal you want to that it is, and today, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Today we have the Holy Scriptures of God speaking to dozens and hundreds of people down through the ages, mm -hmm. and that's how He talks to us. Now, maybe some have a direct personal relationship with him that they actually receive communication. This is how I receive communication. Yeah. You know, I think I'm a bona fide nut. Uh, but when I'm gardening or when I'm out walking, uh, taking a hike, I'll actually say, God, teach me something about the way you sure. are. And by going through the seasons in gardening, watching the plants, and it's, it's amazing what little lessons, I think Ellen White calls them object lessons, mm -hmm. and I think God's a very orderly God, sure. He's a patient God, He's a creative God, and you just get, you could just watch a babbling brook and say, you know, God, teach me something about yourself, and all of a sudden you'll start to see something and apply a principle. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's... Yeah, I... I I run and I listen on my little MP3 player to books from Ellen White and, and scripture sometimes, and I find them very inspiring. And I think I hear all kinds of things from God, I hear messages that I... You get I, ideas, yes. don't you? And, and solutions to your problems. Or some scientists and some certain areas of scientists would just say, well, that's, you're just, you're just, you're somehow that just, con it's a, it's a, concoction of your own mind. You know, You're I just know drawing these conclusions and... There are scientists you know. who claim that Moses made up the first five books of, of the Bible through hallucinations. You know, I don't believe that If you like to believe that, good luck. No, I don't that, believe that. That would just be a minute. real stretch because that would be impossible to have done that. I don't believe that because I know my silly little mind and I could never come to the ideas and conclusions that I do if I would just say think of them myself. I know they have to be from somewhere else than just yeah. in my head. But you know, I I'm bet, not that smart. I bet there are uh, 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 Buddhists mm -hmm. who, who meditate, mm -hmm. and I bet they come up with the same, same arguments. Well, for probably not the, the same ones, but ones they think are inspired. Well, I know, but I'm, what I'm saying is that the ideas may be different. We might disagree with the ideas, but well, maybe I, I, my, my, uh, my argument here is that they're going to be saying the same thing you're saying. Maybe the Buddhists, who, who's to say God doesn't talk to Buddhists? If Buddhists are trying to think about God? Now, a general revelation That's would be true. something about nature, mm -hmm. and the Bible itself tells us that we can learn about God through looking at nature. Just, I'm sure that there are thousands of examples. One could be the trees emitting some chemical to ward off some type of insect from, from eating that tree. Another one could be, I'm really fascinated by dolphins being born. Mm -hmm. Baby dolphins born in the ocean as the baby dolphin comes out of the womb. Now imagine a human being, the smartest creature on planet Earth, and here you have a dolphin comes out of the womb, swims up to the surface, gets a breath of air, comes back down and swims right alongside mom, that's a miracle from God. Yeah. And there are thousands of things like that, never ending. We can learn, we can talk to God through nature. General but revelation. Is all the evil that we see in our na natural world a result of Satan's activity? No. Or some of it the result of God's activity? Most of it's a result of human activity. <laughs> well, if God is our, if is our, here's, we, we've got some big questions to deal with in this lesson. Why did you use evil? Well, Who hold you? on. If God is our creator, does that give him authority over us? That's the first question. Yes. To what extent does that make him responsible for everything that is happening in our world? Do we really believe that God created everything? Isaiah 45, 7. Everything. Well, there's good. a... There's a, a tale that's told, and I don't, have no idea who thought this up first. I've heard it from several different sources. It goes something like this. A scientist once challenged the need for God. 
He argued that he could create humanity just as well as any god could. God said, okay, go ahead and do it. The scientists began to gather some dirt, but God said, wait a minute, make your own dirt. <laughs> of course, this story is only hypothetical, but it illustrates a major point. What should we learn from the fact that God has created everything? And there's lots of verses in the Bible. Um, look at Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The world and all that is, in, that is in it belong to the Lord. The earth and all who live on it are His. He built it on the deep waters beneath the earth and laid its foundation in the ocean depths. Pretty clear, right? Uh, there's many other passages. In virtually all areas of human endeavor, it is recognized that creatorship implies ownership. That's why we have elaborate systems of copyright and patents. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Well, God created not only the material from which our universe is made, but also designed it specifically how he wanted it. Out of it, he made every creature, including us. And by the way, if you're interested in these handouts that we use to, for our discussions here, they're all available on our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Does it make, because God created everything, does that make him responsible for evil? Yes. <laughs> the origin of that evil came from Satan. No matter what, he started, he started everything in motion, started, gave people their freedom to do what they want. Anything that happens, the buck starts back to the Creator. And he takes responsibility. Right. But a God of love has to allow us the freedom to make our own choices. In order to choose to love, we must also have the capacity to hate. As a result of freedom, first of all, Lucifer, and then all the rest of us, have followed him in our rebellion against God. God's response was the plan of redemption. Now we belong to God twice. He created us and he redeemed us. Look at some verses. Look at Genesis 3, 17. And he said to the man, You listen to your wife and ate the fruit which I told you not to eat. Because of what you have done, the ground will be under a curse. Who's putting the curse on the ground? God. You will have to work hard all your life to make it produce enough food for you. So what is implied by that curse? Well, hang on. God said, cursed is the ground because of you. Mm -hmm. I heard somebody say God. Isn't, isn't a curse so. kind of a reaction to what you do? It isn't God putting a hex on something. How do you know? Because I, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Well, Absolutely does not make sense. Well, let's look at another one. Because look, because look at, if I have if I have a child at home, and he starts taking drugs, mm -hmm. he becomes a curse of the family mm -hmm. because of what he does. Mm -hmm. Well, what what put the hex on the family for the curse? Well, in that illustration, it was the kid taking drugs. Well, the same thing with this. Okay, but let's look at another one. How are you going to explain this one? Look at Genesis 4, starting with verse, well, actually, we should really start with verse 10. Then the Lord said, why have you done, he's talking to Cain, why have you done this terrible thing? Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground like a voice calling for revenge. You are placed under a curse. Who did that? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Cain I, did. I'm just reading to you from the Cain Bible. Cain did. It's, it's saying it right there. You are placed under a curse and could no longer farm because the soil. Because of what he did. Hold on just a minute. I, I think we're both <laughs> interpreting this okay, differently. Listen, listen, you haven't. <laughs> you are placed under a curse and can no longer farm the soil. It has soaked up your brother's blood as if it had opened his mouth to receive it when you killed him. If you tried to grow crops, now let's, let's stop and back up a little bit. When Cain and Abel offered their sacrifices, what did Cain offer? Cain offered the uh, vegetation, vegetables, the, something the from the land. He had grown, grown from the soil, right? He, he grew it, yes. Yes, he grew it from the soil. Now, vegetarian. If you try, now God's speaking to Cain saying, now you're a great gardener. But if you try to grow crops, the soil will not produce anything. You will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. There, there's the point right there. He can't stay in one place to plant a 
plant, so, plant a crop and watch it grow. He's a wanderer because of what no, he no. did. He becomes a wanderer because he can't grow anything. No, no, yes, no. Yes, that's what it says. It's the other way around. <laughs> no, it it works the other, the other way. way around, too. No. It does. That's not what the verse says. Maybe it, it that's what you like. It does say that. No, it doesn't. It does say that. <laughs> and, and then, to be fair, right here, verse 13, Cain said to the Lord Yahweh, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. So I will be a homeless wanderer on the earth, and anyone who finds me will kill me. So the God Lord says, no, I'm not going to let that happen. The Lord is driving him away, yes. according to Cain. So, so. And we have, we're not finished yet. Look he's at, driving him away look because at, he, what he did. Right. How well, can he, yeah, how can he, he, no, how a, can he keep say, him there? To say because mm -hmm. Cain killed Abel, the soil no longer produces, is, he, can't, he can't grow anything from the soil. That's a curse from God. There's no way you can no, say. No, it's because he can't stay in one place to no, break. No, no. Why not? Why okay, not? Tell so me why now not. I'm, now I'm going to come to another verse. Look at chapter 5 of Genesis, verse 29. Well, and let's read verse 28. When Lamech was 182, he had a son and said, From the very ground on which the Lord put a curse, now, how would you like to reinterpret that? It's the buck coming back to me this because of what I did. Because this, of what I did. Okay. It always comes from the Lord. Okay, it comes from the Lord. That's the important part. So but I don't can, think the Lord before you puts leave, a curse on the... Before you leave that, can we go to um, which the Lord put a curse? This child will bring us relief from all our hard work. What does he mean, this child will bring us relief from all our hard work? Well, and, and the child's name was Noah. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder how he brought Noah. Noah is close to, is similar to the word for relief. I don't know whether, whether he thought, okay, now I've got a son that's going to help me do the work I have to do. I don't know what he meant. Mm, it's interesting, yeah. Okay, but now let's, let's, look, let's go back to where we were. In the days of Noah, a double curse re was resting upon the earth in consequence of Adam's transgression and of the murder committed by Cain. Consequence. Mm -hmm. Sure. Consequence. Yes. But the consequence is God doing something. <laughs> so clearly, Not the natural result of the sins. God is coming God's in here and putting it on zapping him. it. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's how we got to take it. No, I'm not so sure. <laughs> well... <laughs> Okay, now that's page 90, paragraph 1. First of all, God told Adam that he would have to work hard to produce enough food for himself and his family. Mm -hmm. More than that, he would have to fight with thorns and thistles. Mm -hmm. As a result, now, did thorns and the thistles arrive because Eve ate the fruit? Well, it wasn't in the Garden of Eden, that's for sure, no, but he got thrown out of the Garden of Eden, and we don't know exactly what was out there. Well, yeah. you know, when uh, sin came into the world, thorn and thistles, the animals started fighting and mm -hmm. eating each other. The plants started dying. None of that was in the world before. That's and, right. And Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets that right before the flood, there was hardly any change. But you're speaking of a massive change right there. Well, the animals were uh, vicious. Mm -hmm. And that changed right then. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, but she said there sin. was no change. There was only tokens of, of um, what she called tokens of um, sin. Uh, the results of sin. Are, are you saying that the animals didn't eat one another before the flood? No, I'm just saying that there's something curious here because she says right before the flood, there wasn't much change in the earth. And that's where you read the part where it says that uh, there was a double curse. Mm -hmm. But she says as far as the earth goes, everything was still very good. Yeah, the third it curse was, was the flood. Now there's three curses. Okay. But the question is, why did all the animals start, I mean, if they did, mm -hmm. they didn't have anything to do with this. Why did they start eating one another? And, that's the, and, that's the question. Know, what, what, what is it about this? And also this... The sin thing, it's like, like something has happened to our nature, some, some, some biological or, or 
laws of physics switch has been triggered in us so that almost as if God doesn't even have control you, over sin it. Sin is... Something interesting, sorry to interrupt you, Joanne, something interesting about God having control or not having control regarding the animals. The Most people would feel that the fiercest creature on planet Earth is the shark. Yet many people don't realize this. While there are thousands of people out there on the beach swimming, there are also thousands of sharks, at least hundreds of sharks nearby, and they're not actually attacking those people. Well, sharks don't like to eat people, and they'll eat anything. They'll eat rocks, license plates, you know, whatever comes along, whatever floats down the water, they'll eat it. But they generally, they, if they taste humans, they kind of, oops, sorry, unless you're already passed away or or bleeding. Well, there's a lot of blood floating in the water, yeah. And then they get confused and then it's too late. But it's kind of interesting. Well, what, what additional curse came to the flood? Well, then the world or the earth, the a earth lot. and the world were completely changed. Seasons? Yeah. L Seasons? Life, life spans were certainly mm -hmm. shortened. Well, clearly the topography of our world was completely changed by the flood. Yeah. Well, we do not know exactly what the surface of the earth looked like before the flood and, and immediate, or even immediately after the flood as a result of soil erosion and leaching and other factors which we may not recognize. Many parts of our world have become uninhabitable and the soil unproductive. Can we still see the evidence in our world of God's curse on the ground? Is that it? curse extend to human beings as well? Why did God do that? Would this make it very difficult for us to clearly distinguish between problems that are a result of God's curse and the problems that are a result of Satan's activities and sin? Does God, as a God of righteousness, have to curse sin? I mean, is sin just, um, does it cause God to curse it because sin is alien to God's character? Yeah. Well, I think sin has the curse built into it, yeah. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, the, t the mm -hmm. tokens were decay. Tokens. That's what she says. There's only tokens of decay. Yeah. Everything else was pretty well, much one, like it was. One clear evidence of how things have changed is in the natural watering system, which existed before the flood. There was no rain, but water came up from beneath the ground, Genesis 2, 4 to 6. Think how different our world would be today if all parts, including places like the Sahara Desert, were naturally watered by dew or springs that came up from underneath. I mean, yes. think of In the Mojave Desert. Yes, exactly. Us. Ken, mm. I've read that in the Bible, and it says that it happened before that there was before there was man to till the soil, mm -hmm. and before the and the green plants grew. Mm -hmm. So, what makes you think that it goes further than that? I mean, just I looking mean, at further. the Bible, that that after creation it was that way. After creation? Right. Because it says, it says before man, before man tilled the soil, was there to till the soil, there was any green plants. There was, God said no rain, but the ground was watered from un underneath mm -hmm. to water the ground. And all this happened before the creation. Well, mm, yeah, you can't, you can't come to that conclusion for sure. Well, you can't really come to the other conclusion for sure. Of course, Ellen White says that it was watered from the ground, but uh, she she points to that verse. So, and this is how the universe was created, the Garden of Eden. Well, now let me see if I can get the whole thing up here. I missed something. So yeah. are we saying that condensation wasn't working from, you know, the sun, the water, this wasn't happening? I'm missing well, something. Uh, it, it was said that it didn't rain until the flood. When the came. Lord God made the universe, there were no plants on the earth and no seeds that sprouted. Okay, he started out with an earth and not with a world. Because he had not sent any rain and there was no one to cultivate the land. But water would come up from beneath the surface and water the ground. Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it and so forth. So you're trying to say that that system, which seemed to work very well, went away when God created this earth? No, I'm just saying, world? how do you know that it continued because the, the drought or the, the, the rain started coming. The rain after didn't that. come until after the flood. Okay, the, well, the flood. long time later. 
Well, whatever these curses consisted of, look at Romans 8, 19 to 22. All creation waits with eager longing for God to reveal his children. For creation was condemned to lose its power, its purpose, not only of its own will, but because God willed it to be so. Yet there was a hope that creation itself would one day be set free from its slavery to decay, decay there's your decay, and would share the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that up to the present time, all creation groans with pain like the pain of childbirth. So how does creation groan with pain? Well, it's creation is experiencing decay. Uh, the big trees are experiencing termites in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the tree was groaning. Um, could be groaning just because we're here, sin. Well, there's got to be some kind of a relationship here to the to the birth of, of, of ch children through them. I mean, it's comparing it to that. So I'm not sure I understand how the termites work <laughs> are, are fitting in here. Well, look at, look at some examples of what's happening on our earth, which we know for sure. The Lord asked Satan, this is Job 1, verse 7, what have you been doing? Satan answered, I have been walking here and there, roaming around the earth. Now we know about that. Not only that, but the New Testament tells us, be alert. This is 1 Peter 5, 8. Be alert, be on the watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So we, he's here with us. Let's beware. There's no question that Satan is active and determined to succeed against all odds. When the great controversy is finally over, Satan will be dead. So what does that mean? That means this is a life and death struggle for him. And of course, it's a life and death struggle for us in a different sense. But he, how, can he, it, how can it be a life and death struggle when there's no, there is no opportunity for eternal life or well, immortality for him? I mean, the, the way he extends his life is by getting us to keep on sinning. He's managed to do it for 2,000 years now. Well, he knows his well. time is short, though. Well, it's talking about our day. His time. So do we agree with the notion of deism, that God created the world and left it alone? If Satan is here with us, so does that mean, like some people believe, God is not here as well? No. No. Thank you. Not at all. God is omnipresent. Okay. And, he, and he's not on vacation. Very no. Good. Every breath we take is a, one of the quotes that Ken talks about is a rebound of the finger of God. That's every 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 heartbeat, I guess. Every heartbeat is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Okay. Well, now is the time, John twelve thirty one, you know, what what's the what's our relationship to this devil? Well, now is the time, Jesus said, for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. Is there any question about what the final result will be? And look at John 14, 30. I cannot talk with you much longer because the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me, but the world must know that I love the Father. That is why I do everything as he commands me and so forth. So loving the Father is a contrast to doing what the devil wants you to do. How sad that the Bible has to call the ruler of this world Satan. Yeah. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the ruler of this world was Jesus? Yeah, it will be. Mm -hmm. And they are wrong about judgment because the ruler of this world has already been judged. Okay, Get to another one, Ephesians 2, verse 2. At that time you followed the world's evil way. You obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers in space, the spirit which now controls the people who disobey God. The spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. And then finally, we know this famous verse, Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. Ken, That's a pretty scary thing. Yes. For the first time, I heard people on the news stations talking about there are evil forces in the world. And I've never heard anybody admit that Satan was in the world or there were evil forces. 
Do you think people avoid thinking there's evil forces in the world to avoid the uh, subject of judgment? Do they go together if they admit there's evil forces in the world, then we're going to be judged? Well, Christians should think that, but not necessarily others. Mm -hmm. Well, this is on secular news after yeah. the shootings, wondering what's going on. They're, they're yeah. They're always trying to find a reason why something happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you, sometimes all you can say is that there's, a, there's evil in the world. That's the only explanation you can come up with. Yeah. Were well, you going to comment or? Oh, I'll pass. Okay. <laughs> well, Jesus and Paul here have made it clear that one who claims to be a ruler of this world has been judged. However, that does not remove the fact that we are battling against a formidable, formidable foe. Remember what happened to Job. Read Romans 5, 12. Since, came, since sin came into the world through one man, and his sin brought death with it. As a result, death is spread to the whole human race. Why? Because everyone has sinned. So death is spread, spreads to us not because of his sin, but because of whose sin? Our sin, right? Notice that we die because we are also sinners, following the example of Satan. Why do we commit sin? Devil made me do it. <laughs> That's what I always say. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at James 1, starting with verse 13. If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say, this temptation comes from God. Do you blame, ever blame God? God made me do it? No. No? For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. <laughs> but people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by Satan's temptations? No, by their own evil desires. Then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth, gives birth to death. So we can bypass the devil and all that sin. We don't even need his help. If we just, yeah, right, right, to do sin. Mm -hmm. But if we just stay away from that, there is an escape out. If we try to live honorably and follow the Lord and hang out with the Lord's people. Does that work every time for you? Well, not, not to be, no, it doesn't. Not yet. No, no, not yet, still trying. But uh, not to be completely sin-free, which would theoretically be impossible, but at least to position oneself into, you know, a right group of people. Hang out with the right crowd. You'll get into less trouble. Uh, dwell upon the Lord, you'll be av able to avoid the different troubles and things like that. That was my point. But Most no, of the sins in I don't, this world. I cannot be sin free yeah. myself. I need the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Most of the sins in this world come about because of our selfish and evil desires. Many of them probably came just from plain old evil habits. Other evils are brought about because of the deterioration that has happened in the human race from Adam's day until this. People get run over by drunk drivers. Well, you know, Ken, God made us a bucket of desires, right? I mean, he didn't make humans that had no desires or emotions. Mm -hmm. So something happened to our desires when sin came into us that these desires started going towards sin. But God didn't create desireless people. Mm -hmm. I mean, he said, Adam and Eve, your desire will be for each other. And, you know, so something happened to what God made. Desireless, that's pretty good. That's good. <laughs> well, other evils are brought about because of the deterioration that has happened in the human race from Adam's day until this. Many sins are also a result of the direct temptations of Satan and his angels. And I, I uh, let me just stop for a pause for a second. I work with a li young lady who is, is a real challenge. Um, her husband has been an alcoholic and sort of left her, and he comes back and he goes back and forth. She has a sister whose husband also had some problems. He died last week because of his health problems. Saturday night, which is what, three or four days ago now, her, that man, her and that man's son was killed by a drunk driver. He was in a walkway the way he was, right where he was supposed to be. Drunk woman came along, wiped him out. So in less than a week, she lost her husband and her son. Just. And there are problems. So, you've, you've outlined a litany of 
uh, circumstances here why I have such a hard time with this sin. So I guess I'm not really all that guilty. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, it's not really all my fault. Well, many temptations are the direct result of the work of Satan and his angels. And they didn't come up, you went on reading here, you didn't come up with any comments to my comment. <laughs> <laughs> and there are probably some sins we commit because we just want to. <laughs> <laughs> Is that in there? If you heard, you heard, you heard about the little boy who was uh, fighting with his brother and, and he'd been kicking his brother and finally, and finally ended up spitting on his brother. And the, by that point, the mother thought, that's, that's, that's just too much. And mm -hmm. she, she came out, Johnny, Johnny, you want the devil take completely control of you? I mean, is the devil taking, telling you to do all this? He said, well, maybe the devil thought of the kicking and the other, but the spitting was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, have you seen the destructive influence of Satan in your own life? What was the result? Well, in the last 200 years, the amount of information in the form of knowledge has literally exploded. However, all of this knowledge has not necessarily produced wiser people. We may even understand things better, but that does not necessarily make us wiser. Look we at it. We have had so much nutrition knowledge mm. in the past years, more than I got in the, what, 50s and 60s, and yet we grow heavier. Uh, type 2 diabetes is, is exploding, even though we have. Mm -hmm. Dr. Oz and all these other things. Yeah. Just because we have the knowledge doesn't mean we practice what we know. Yeah, but we have and more most, knowledge. And most humans don't. Yeah. Well, if we, if we could just practice what we know, I would just hand out copies of the Ten Commandments, we'd all be saved. Yeah. Reduce the cost of police. Right. <laughs> well, notice these passages from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 21, first of all. For the message about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost. For, but for those of us who are being saved, it is God's power. The scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the understanding of the scholars. So then, where does that leave the wise or the scholars or the skillful debaters of this world? God has shown that this world's wisdom is foolishness. And... Going over to chapter 3, the same verses, 18 to 21. No one should fool himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise by this world's standards, he should become a fool in order to be really wise. For what this world considers to be wisdom is nonsense in God's sight. As the scripture says, God traps the wise in their cleverness. And another scripture says, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are worthless. No one then should, be bo should boast about what human beings can do. Actually, everything belongs to you, and he goes on to talk about the people in Corinth. Is God talking about scientists when he says that? <laughs> yes. Is he talking about theologians when he says and theologians Yes. And what, does, what do these verses teach us about the human knowledge and wisdom? But I, Ken, I'd like to, to be fair to the scientists, I'd like to say that many of the great discoveries in the history of the world have been made by uh, God-fearing, believing scientist, even in this day and age. So I don't want people to feel that, you know, we're against the scientists. Many people at this very table actually are, are quite uh, knowledgeable in many different yeah. uh, yeah, but there areas. Are, there are, I'm sure there are some scientists who would say very knowledgeably, knowledge, knowledgeably that <clears throat> there are many of the great things that have been discovered have been discovered by atheistic scientists as well. Is, is this saying that if you are a scientist who has discovered, or a theologian, or whatever, that you're supposed to remain extremely humble and, and say how much you still don't know, or something like that? Is I think that would be a good idea in any case. Mm -hmm. It sounds like So you don't gloat in your own wisdom? Well, many of the early scientists, <laughs> people like Newton and Kepler and Galileo, I mean, these are names that probably all of us have heard of, were firm believers in God. They were certain that their scientific studies were simply ways of helping to explain the work of God. Kepler once said, O oh God, I think thy thoughts after thee. What do you think would happen if some well-known scientist made such a statement today? Oh, he'd be ridiculed. 
by, by many. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Many scientists believe that they now have an explanation for the origin of the universe and the origin of the human race without any supernatural activity by God. Some are now going an extra step and trying to explain the so-called miracles in the Bible, saying that there is a result, they were just a result of natural forces. They claim that the Red Sea was parted in the days of Moses by a powerful wind. And there's other explanations, all kinds of stuff. Scientists have, been suggest have even suggested that some of the visions in the Bible, for example, when Moses was with God on the mountain, they were actually just cases where Moses was taking some kind of hallucinogenic substance and saw all these things simply as hallucinations. How would you respond to someone who suggested such an explanation? How many hallucinations have resulted in positive outcomes? And how like many, what Moses, and how many Moses hallucinations give, a, give us a consistent picture over 40 years? It makes sense, and it's it structured. Sense. And well, you know, you know, if you follow some of those stories, like the one you illustrated, you mentioned about the wind blowing the Red Sea, and that miracle, you know, <clears throat> when you f read more and follow that story, you find that every time the children of Israel came to a yeah. body of water, right. many, many times, probably hundreds of times, that same phenomena happened according to the Bible, so uh, it's kind of hard to, kind of hard to, what, what of people don't, don't read on, they, lot well, of it's wins. A, that's right, it's, it's something that they, they, they don't, we don't like for some reason, so we begin to make up uh, these reasons, but when you read on, you find out, uh, and it would be the same thing with these visions of, of Moses and the visions of Daniel, did they all have come across some hallucinogenic yeah. thing, you know? Well, well we have the to be careful <coughs> that we don't take away what might be God's mechanism of driving, the, of opening up the, the waters of the Red Sea and the Jordan River at the correct time. Maybe he used wind that he created. Is there mm -hmm. any, it, does it make a difference? Right. No. Right. Okay. And one, one thing for sure is if, if we look at the writings of Moses, it's very well written. This is not something written by someone on any type of hallucinogenic drug or substance. It's very tight and from book to book and then between the different authors as well. Mm -hmm. And this was at a time where they, you know, didn't have, uh, don't want to say any company names, but Office Depot or Staples or something like that where you go down, get your pens, get your paper, put it on your computer. This is very tight and it has withstood the test of time. Mm -hmm. Moses was not on any hallucinogenic that, that we know of. Well, look at an example from, Lord, uh, from David. What did he have to say about creation? This is Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, your greatness is seen in all the world. Your praise reaches up to the heavens. It is sung by children and babies. You are safe and secure from all your enemies. You stop anyone who opposes you. When I look at the sky, which you may have made, you have made at the moon and the stars which you set in their places. What are human beings that you think of them? Mere mortals that you care for them. Yet you made them inferior only to yourself. You crowned them with glory and honor. You appointed them rulers over everything you made. You placed them over all creation, sheep and cattle, and the wild animals too, the birds and the fish, and the creatures of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, your greatness is seen in all the world. You get such deep, deep theological understanding. I mean, he says there <clears throat> something that, that we have mentioned here, and that is <clears throat> that he has made humans inferior only to himself, which would mean, as we have discussed here, um, was it in our last session, <clears throat> that humans are uh, a creation above and beyond everything else. How in the world did David pick, yeah. you know? You know, uh, God called David a man after my own heart. Is that because David knew and expressed God, God's heart? David knew God? Because those, it sounds like David yeah. really knew who God was. That's well, Sorry to interrupt you. That scripture also, I believe, was quoted by the astronauts mm -hmm. in outer space. 
Oh. So, interestingly enough, even the astronauts can believe in God. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly, David believed that because God created the universe, he is sovereign over all. More than that, he cares for us and gives us dominion over the other creatures on this earth. We can learn something of God's power and his glory by studying the universe he created. Look, for example, at Psalm 19. This is very familiar to many people. How clearly the sky reveals God's glory. How plainly it shows what he has done. Each day announces it to the following day. Each night repeats it to the next. No speech or words are used. No sound is heard. Yet their message goes out all over the world and is heard to the ends of the earth. How many parts of the earth do not have day and night? I'm not talking about special situations in the dead of winter or the middle of summer. So even those parts of the earth at some point in time do have days and nights, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yet their message goes out to all the earth and is heard to the ends of the earth. God made a home in the sky for the sun. It comes out in the morning like a happy bridegroom, like an athlete eager to, eager to run a race. It starts at one end of the sky and goes across to the other. Nothing can hide from its heat and so forth. Okay. Who wrote that one? That was, well, oh, you want to know who the, uh, I don't see, hold on. A song by David, it says, probably true. The Hubble telescope has certainly begun to reveal to us how small we are compared to the size of the universe. Why would a God who could create all of that and no doubt has millions and billions of creatures on other worlds, why would he care about this tiny little rebellious blue marble? The well, here is where the drama and the play <coughs> is being played out. Okay. Um, despite the center stage. Despite, center stage. Despite the drama, we are a product of his creation. The Creatures here are a product of his creation. The plants are a product of his creation. Yeah. And he just cares about that. He also cares about all those other planets, too. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but nothing we can learn from nature comes close to the truths that we can learn by a careful study of the life and death of Jesus. <coughs> now we turn to special revelation. And Jesus was just like his father, John 14, 9. Notice these words from Ellen White. Science, so-called, and religion will be placed in opposition to each other because finite men, this was written in 1890, because finite men do not comprehend the power and greatness of God. These words of Holy Writ were presented to me, quote, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, draw away disciples after them. Acts 20, verse 30. This will surely be seen among the people of God. Ellen White, manuscript, uh, medical, I'm sorry, Manuscript 16, 1890, and Medical Missionary Work 98.2, etc., other places. So the world we live in and the world which scientists are studying today, think about this carefully, has experienced not only deterioration as, as a result of our sin, but also the threefold curse of God. How different is it from the world which God originally created? We don't know. Science only has the capacity to study the present world, and it only has a human being understanding to evaluate it. How can that be a safe criteria for disbelieving the Word of God? In light of all this, is it possible to reconcile Scripture and true science? From the Christian perspective, how would you define science? I think it's always interesting how scientists will so firmly say, and two million years ago this happened. Yeah. The oh, Hubble, give me a break. The Hubble and that's apparently always revised back to three million, and then four million, and you then weren't there. There. twenty million, yeah. and then a billion. And the Hubble yeah. apparently found seven new galaxies that uh, were created right after the Big Bang. So they're going to put the Hubble away and create something even to really go and explore those galaxies. Well. What, is the, what should be the relationship between special revelation and general revelation? Is there some area of overlap between the two? Or is nature over here and God's word is over here and never the twain shall meet? Well, we, we would call Moses uh, is a prophet 
and that would fit into the special revelation. Moses talked often about uh, general revelation, like nature. One, uh, many people believe that Moses wrote the uh, book of Job, mm -hmm. and the book of Job has many things relating to general revelation. Maybe a tiny little obscure one might be the people, they don't think about this, but if you think about this, how could this happen? A baby eagle being pushed out of the nest, I believe that's mm -hmm. in Job, yes. free falling down to earth off of the cliff, and the mother eagle dives down. The mother eagle pushed the baby out of the nest, most likely, and then the mother eagle flies down and catches the yeah, baby and then okay. flies back up to the nest and does it again. Mm -hmm. How could a creature through evolution do something like this? She would have lost yeah, all yeah, yeah. she would have lost all of her children and there would have been no reproduction of the species, no propagation. Many of the theologians and philosophers have tried to explain how it is possible for a good God to create a bad world. Can we explain that to the satisfaction of anyone who might ask us? In his, his special rev revelation, um, a necessity because we fail to observe general revelation. Is it? If, if we paid attention to general rev revelation, would we really need special revelation? In the garden, yeah. God was spoke to Adam and Eve face to face. That's special revelation. Mm -hmm. Oh, so the Bible's special revelation too, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. The whole thing. Well, well the, the one weak spot I see in this is, for all kinds of revelation, is the word interpretation. Because there's, mm -hmm. there's um, lots of people that I know of that read out of the Bible, and I think they're crackpots. Mm -hmm. And it's just the way they, they interpret it. And they'll look at me and yeah. say, well, it's the way you interpret it. Well, it's so. interesting. Uh, the question you asked, how do you explain these? Mm -hmm. Without the umbrella of the great controversy theme, I've sit in churches for years and, and struggle, 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 struggle figuring it out. And it all seems to fall in place when you keep in mind uh, what we just studied in the last lesson, yeah. how evil came into the world. Well. Are, are there examples, Ken, of, um, of, of passages of Scripture where we find um, people, let's say in the New Testament, who we know are godly people, but they, they have interpreted something differently from one another and have come into conflict? All the time. That's not good news. Well, <laughs> I mean, why are there so Paul many so-called churches here in North America? Well, then... Don't they all claim to how, believe the how, Scriptures? How are we going to place any confidence in this in special revelation? I mean, I can understand well, how we can look at some Jay, general Jay revelation, but... in the Bible, not... Yeah, okay. not well, that's what I was talking maybe. about in the, yeah. was in the Bible. Are, oh, are there they, examples of... I don't know. pulled out of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, did, we have some examples where Peter read something and Paul read something and they disagreed about what was, what was the proper interpretation. So, my goodness, how are we supposed to... How well, we supposed to, how when I read this, am I supposed to understand? Am I supposed to have confidence last, that I'm understanding the right way? Last week we read a passage from Great Controversy, page five ninety three, that says, "None but those who have fortified their minds with the truths of Scripture will stand to the last great conflict." So would so, that would that mean that these these uh, New Testament writers? Uh, uh, because they're in a conflict with one another, one or more of them hadn't fortified their minds with the proper truths? More. Hmm. Yeah. My goodness. Why do you think Peter made the mistake he did? But by the time they came to the end of their lives, they were all ready to sacrifice their lives for God. We know that even in the awful times that will take place just before the second coming of Christ, God will intervene to protect his people. Have you ever had an experience where God was apparently God has apparently intervened, perhaps even as a result of some terrible event, to work something out for good? And we think of Romans 8:28, in all things God works for good. Primitive people who have who were animists 
worshiping various aspects of nature, often had the idea that whatever God was out there was quite capricious. Death could come at any moment. God's blessing might be shining upon a person at one moment and calamity the next. Darwinists are not really much better off. How could a person worship a God who wasn't in any way responsible for a plan known as survival of the fittest, which really means just survival of those who survive? Earlier we quoted David Hall from his article, this was several weeks ago, The God of the Galapagos, in which he said, The God of the Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. By contrast, Christian believers see a basic order in the universe. They see a rational structure in nature, and they believe that the basic order and the natural structure are a result of the mastermind behind it all. In fact, the order depended upon by scientists for their study implies an orderly creator. Um, Fortunately, those of us who understand something about the great controversy realize that there's a good explanation for the problems we see in the world around us. God is not responsible for evil, but he's responsible for the freedom that allows for evil. But he's responsible for the freedom that allows evil to, uh, he's not responsible for the evil itself, but for the freedom that allows the evil to exist. In our day, we are seeing the final results of thousands of years of evil. In effect, sin is going to seed. Mass murders, tsunamis, earthquakes, hurricanes, and tornadoes all suggest that our world is coming to an end. So why do you think God gave the three curses that we mentioned earlier? Were they intended to be disciplinary in nature? Did God plan that thistles and thorns would be disciplinary? Paul used to talk about a thorn in the flesh. Of course, that was no literal thorn, but some kind of a physical problem, which he repeatedly asked God to remove, but which God refused to remove. Read 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Are thistles and thorns then here to teach us an important lesson? Well, freedom and love are so important to God that he would rather die than give, up, give them up or compromise them in any way. Are we glad that he has done that? Do you wish that God were more manipulative in our world? Or are you happy for the freedom God has given us? A lot of things maybe seem confusing to us. We are indeed looking through a glass darkly, but God is out there, God is in his word, and we can discover him if we're willing to take the time to read it and learn for ourselves. See you next week.